Hi everybody, it's Professor Miller. Um, this lecture is going to cover um, a pain assessment for Chapter 10. The reason I wanted to go into this first is because it does affect um, other systems and I feel like it's something that we need to talk about before we even go into like different systems like cardiac, um, GI, etc. Because um, pain affects everything essentially and when you're obtaining a health history and all that, um, it definitely can change your approach and um, looking at other factors as well. So I wanted to cover this before we move into other um, systems, essentially. Pain, we actually, you'll hear this used a lot. Pain has been noted as like the fifth vital sign. Um, you know, about probably 15, 20 years ago, it was, um, they included it and in making sure that patients are always being treated appropriately for pain. Um, and, you know, essentially recognizing that it's a complex and very subjective experience for the patient. Um, so making sure that we're always treating pain appropriately for each patient. Um, more recently, and I'm sure you probably have all heard of it, is the issue with the opioid ep epidemic. So um, nowadays, unfortunately, it's become a area where you have to weigh um, the benefits and really look at your patient closely because you have to treat patients. You can't just assume that everybody is using opioids because they're using it for, you know, substance abuse. You have to treat people um, appropriately and, um, you know, not have that bias there. So it's it's actually become problematic recently. I honestly, that's my opinion on it, but um, I feel like patients are actually being undertreated now because of it. So we have to find a healthy balance between treating pain and also, um, you know, doing it responsibly. Um, when we talk about pain, it's very, very subjective. So this is always, pain is always subjective. That's, you know, it's the patient's feelings. It's how they, you know, perceive it. Um, it's very complex because it does originate um, within the brain, um, your central nervous system, your peripheral nervous system. And we'll talk about a few different types of pain too. So it kind of clarifies this a little bit more. Um, so we have nociceptors, um, and these are like the nerve endings that detect sensations, essentially, and that's where the pain is originated, um, you know, peripherally. And this is what carries it to your central nervous system or up to your brain. These are all over, so they're located within your skin, connective tissue, muscle, your abdomen, you know, your pelvic viscera, so your internal organs as well. So that's why people will have pain when, you know, like you have appendicitis or something like that. Um, so this is what transmits this painful um, sensation to your central nervous system to perceive it. Um, they're stimulated either by trauma or injury or chemical mediators. Chemical, chemical mediators um, is essentially like those inflammatory mediators like um, prostaglandins and stuff like that. So when you have inflammation, like if a patient had cellulitis or something like that, they're going to have pain there because of that inflammatory response or chemical response there. And it does trigger this, um, you know, response back up to the central nervous system. So a few different types of pain, and I wanted to cover this because it helps you understand that neuropathic pain, um, you know, like that peripheral neuropathy or different areas or post-herpetic um, neuralgia, which is from like shingles. Um, nociceptive pain is the one that I'm talking about when you have tissue damage or you have an incision or you have trauma to an area or postoperative pain. Mm -hmm. Um, this is like that typical general pain that you would um, think about essentially. Now in the middle we do have mixed, so that it'd be a combination of like typical pain and neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is very complex and I'll, um, you know, give you some examples here, but um, trigeminal neuralgia is actually, um, your trigeminal nerve is in your, um, up in your face and, um, these are really complex because you really, you can't see it essentially. So same thing with like diabetic neuropathy. You can't see any abnormal, you know, skin tissue there, but it's all um, at that micro level of the nerves essentially. So like trigeminal neuralgia, a lot of these two are very, very painful. Like trigeminal neuralgia, I mean, patients will have, um, you know, uh, neurosurgery for this. I mean, it's literally, it's that bad. I mean, um, so neuropathic pain can be very excruciating for a patient. And a lot of times, because we can't see it, we kind of disregard it. And it's unfortunate. We cannot do that, obviously. Um, so you really have to look at the context of the patient and look at, you know, their history, what's going on with them, and, you know, where it could possibly be stemming from. Neuropathic, like low back pain, um, that's the other thing. Like a lot of patients that have, um, you know, like a herniated disc, it pushes on that nerve and they have that nerve pain. And, it, and they could have nerve pain like down the leg, they could have it in the foot, their knee. You know, so it's not even just at that back site, like by your back. It would be in the, you know, like running along those dermatones. 
Um, Post-herpetic neuralgia, like I said, that's with herpes zoster. This is hugely problematic. Um, a lot of older adults that have um, her, uh, herpes zoster or shingles, um, it's unfortunately they end up with post-herpetic neuralgia. It doesn't, you know, sometimes it goes away within six, eight months or a year, or sometimes patients last, it lasts a long time. Um, but it's highly linked with like depression and all that. And a lot of these, a lot of these neuropathic um, disease processes are linked with depression. Um, complex regional pain syndrome, you probably have never heard of it, honestly. Like I probably, I didn't really know much about it until probably about, you know, six, seven years ago when I worked in orthopedics. A lot of times too, it's related to, um, not always, but it can be related to a trauma. They'll, they'll um, endure some kind of trauma, whether it's a fall or a fracture. And it's, it's really odd. If you ever look it up, I'm not going to test you on this. It's just this FYI information, but um, let's say I had a patient actually that had a, um, I think it was a knee injury. But afterwards, she started developing all these, you know, very odd symptoms in her leg, like very, like a, um, like a neuropathy type pain. And they actually get um, these sympathetic responses, and they actually will have, like, their leg will look, like, cool or um, not look, feel, feel cool or look pale. Like, so they start to get those vascular changes with it, too. It's really, it's kind of an odd um, um, diagnosis, but unfortunately, we see it fairly frequently. Um, so it's important to understand that neuropathic pain is there. It's a lot of times very, very problematic for the patient. So we have to make sure that we are addressing that essentially. This is just kind of stuff that I already went through. Um, you can't see it. So a lot of times, even when we do like a CT scan or an MRI, you can't see it. You cannot see, you know, nerves that are running down the leg, you know, essentially. I mean, unless you're doing, I don't know, I mean... You can to some extent, but a lot of times we'll do like an EMG, and EMG looks at that nerve conduction, um, you know, going down. Like, a, for instance, if someone had um, a neck injury and they have arm pain, we'll do, and we can't tell sometimes whether the nerve pain is coming from the arm, like do they have an arm injury or is it coming from the neck? So we'll do an EMG, and the EMG will look at, um, you know, where it's originating from. Is it originating up from the spine or is it originating within the arm? So that's just FYI information, but we have to know, we have to recognize that this is pain for the patient. Visceral pain, um, it's exactly what visceral pain, what you think of. It would be like your kidney, your stomach, your, your gallbladder. Um, so a lot of patients have gallbladder issues. A lot of patients have pancreatitis, um, kidney stones. This is um, what we call visceral pain. A lot of times with visceral pain, not always, but with certain ones, they can have referred pain with it. And actually, I'll go through that in a few slides. Um, but it can um, result from basically like inflammation or injury within that organ or if they have a tumor tumor there or if they have ischemia. Ischemia is lack of blood flow. So you may see this with somebody that has like a bowel um, issue or like a perforation or something like that. And sometimes they'll have distension with it. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on what's going on with it. Like I said, some examples would be like appendicitis, um, ulcer pain. So if they have a um, gastric ulcer, Cholecystitis is your gallbladder that would be, um, that's um, for, you know, basically gallstones or something like that. So this is all transmitted through your autonomic nervous system. But it's important to understand, too, that's why a lot of these patients have complaints with, like, for instance, if you have somebody with um, kidney stones, it's not uncommon that patients will have, like, nausea or vomiting with it or they just look pale or look kind of crummy or they, you know, they're sweating with it. It's because of the autonomic response that's associated with it. Um, like this is just an example. I had a patient that had a kidney stone, didn't really have any pain, which is really odd. There was no pain, but very sick, like nausea, vomiting. And then I would say probably about 12 or 14 hours in, that's when like the flank pain, like the low back pain started hurting or, you know, like they'll have pain like in the low abdomen. Um, but it started with like nausea and vomiting. So sometimes it, it presents, you know, not, not typical, you know, you have an atypical presentation there, but it's important to understand that this is linked with that visceral pain. So other ones, deep somatic pain, this would be like very deep, like your tendon, muscle, bone, that would be like if they have a joint issue or something like that. Um, cutaneous pain, it's exactly what it is. It's your, it's more um, skin surface, subcutaneous tissues, um, psychogenic pain. This is another problematic area, um, unfortunately, too, which we'll talk about in a minute, but with chronic pain, there's actually like a hypersensitive um, response with it, and it's, it's real. It's, it's not, you know, we can't 
chalk it up to, oh, this is psychogenic, and I think it's all in their head, or, um, you know, we can't treat patients like that. We really have to look at what's going on with the patient, their history, how long has it been going on, um, you know, and other factors. So psychogenic pain is often mislabeled, or we say, oh, it's psychogenic pain, or, you know, some, I never say that, but um, you really, it's a lot of times it's due to neuropathic pain that's basically mislabeled as psychogenic pain. So pain is complex. It really is. When you look at it from like this perspective, it, you know, it, it makes you really think about it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is referred pain because this is um, important for you to pick up on abnormals. So there's certain things that will have referred pain, like gallbladder. I'll talk about that when we go to the next slide. But um, what uh, the reason why we have referred pain is because um, if you think about it, like I said, pain is, is all through innervation of your nervous system. It's all going back up to your brain. Well, certain areas or certain organs have that same route or track, essentially, that's triggering the pain response up to the brain. So sometimes these patients will, or with the disease state, they'll have pain in a different area that um, will present, you know, um, you know, not typical. This is more common, like I said, with um, like gallbladder, um, sometimes appendicitis a little bit. We'll talk about that. But however, referred pain is very, very common with, um, well, like I said, with like a um, back injury or a spine injury because the the nerve roots. If you look, if you look at a nerve root, we'll talk about this during musculoskeletal, but. You have nerve roots that, um, you know, that's what does your sensation and, um, you know, your, um, your motor system and all that. So they can have referred pain from the back into the leg or to the, to the arm if it's your neck. Um, so that's kind of what we kind of talk about when we say referred, referred. We'll go through this when we go through certain organ systems, but like even if you think about an MI, like you can, you, patients will sometimes present with jaw pain or left arm pain. Um, Sometimes with um, the stomach or like if they have an ulcer, they'll have mid-back pain. Or even with an MI, they could have mid-back pain with that. And you really have to look at these symptoms and their, you know, their medical history to kind of put this together because, you know, they could have chest pain and it could be related to GERD and not necessarily heart. But you always have to make sure that you're looking at the, you know, your airway breathing circulation and ruling out that it isn't the heart. Um, like musculoskeletal pain is another common one. Some people will have costochondritis of that, um, your sternum, and we have to differentiate. Is it truly musculoskeletal or is it their heart? So that's why it's important to pull all that other data together, like their cardiac enzymes and, um, you know, their history. Do they have a history of coronary artery disease? It's pulling all that information together. That's why I say you can't just look at your exam. You have to look at everything. And we'll go through, like, referred pain as we kind of look at um, different abnormals. But these are just some examples. The gallbladder is a very common one. A lot of times with gallbladder, they present with right um, upper shoulder pain or like on the posterior side of the back. So it's just stuff to think about, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it when we move through systems. This is the dermatome map that I was mentioning. And this is, um, you know, this is something that you can think about when you're looking at stuff. But like if you're looking at a spine injury, you know, if it's at like the lumbar area, they're going to have pain following that lumbar nerve root. If it's up at the neck, if they're going to have pain going down to the, you know, the arm. They, you know, they can have other abnormal sensations, but these are the typical tracks that if you have a nerve compression, it'll, you know, push on that nerve. So that's why, like, if you have a neck injury, they're going to have arm pain or both arm pains. You know, it could depend on which side it's on. But same thing with herpes. Remember I mentioned they follow dermatones. So when they follow dermatones, it's going to present on one of these, it, it's, they're, it's odd, but you'll see literally a rash, and a lot of times it's weird. You see it a lot on the trunk, and it goes down basically like it'll literally follow a line. And that's in it. The other thing too with herpes zoster, like I mentioned, is you have this. You typically always will have it on one side. You're not going to have a rash here and a rash here. It's always going to be on the right or the left of the dermatomes. Um, I mean, it's probably more than you need to know, but I mean, the more you know, the better you are as a clinician. So, um, same thing. Like if you're dealing with spine injuries, sometimes we have patients that present with um, hip pain. It's not their hip, it's coming from their back. Same thing, some patients have knee pain and we think it's their knee, it's not, it's coming from their back. But it takes a lot of you know, diagnostic testing to kind of figure a lot of that out in a good exam. But I just wanna to explain to you the, what referred pain is essentially. Okay, so two types of pain, because this is another important thing too to kind of think about is acute pain versus chronic pain. Acute pain is acute, Chronic is usually greater than three months. Some define it as six, but honestly, I think usually nowadays we kind of define it as three. 
chron uh, chronic pain is very complicated. A lot of times we can't find an underlying cause for it. It's very difficult to treat. Um, it becomes a disease in its own right. So a lot of times there's other symptoms that will go along with this. You know, you have to really look at your patient's quality of life. How are they functioning? Are they able to go to work? A lot of times chronic pain is associated with depression. And nowadays we have a lot of different treatments for chronic pain and it's, um, you know, we kind of deviate from those normal pain meds and we'll use things like um, Cymbalta, which is like an antidepressant, but it's indicated for pain and, you know, or um, Neurontin, we'll use Neurontin for like neuropathy. Um, so it's, chronic pain is very complicated and it's a hard, hard area to treat. So it really is a therapeutic challenge. Um, but like I said, acute pain is more, you can really, honestly, it's usually, that would be like acute appendicitis or, you know, like an injury or a trauma. And it has, we know where it's coming from. We know that it's going to end or it should end. Um, some, sometimes, unfortunately, acute pain turns into chronic pain, but um, it's a lot easier to treat, essentially. Like I said, with chronic pain, um, like I said, it really affects the rest of their, you know, their life. You have to look at issues like employment. Um, a lot of patients end up on disability. Um, you know, in the older adult, a lot of times it causes depression. It can cause depression in anybody. Um, these patients have issues with medications. Sometimes they're on multiple medications, and... Um, it does, it causes problems with family relationships, um, sexual concerns because of the medications they're on, financial worries because they're not, you know, they're not working, and then um, anger for, and frustration because sometimes their treatment isn't meeting their needs and, um, you know, or they feel like their providers aren't doing enough. You know, why can't they figure this out or, you know, eliminate it essentially. So it, you have to realize that, like, it affects obviously all parts of their body and their life. Um, sleeping issues are a huge one. Um, you know, it just, it's a complex issue. So, so when you're in the hospital or wherever setting you're practicing in, um, you know, we'll have rating scales and I'm sure you've seen them before if you work in the hospital or some kind of setting like that. Um, and it's really to use to track their baseline, look at changes in their baseline, look at is their pain medicine, medicine working, um, you know, and really to evaluate their care and their treatment. So a lot of times we'll use that numeric pain scale. A lot of times they're literally, we'll have a chart. Sometimes they have them on the wall with like, you know, one through 10, you know, or you can even ask your patient like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel your pain is today at this point in time? And we always use this to assess after you give them their pain meds as well. So what we have is the visual analog scale, you know, so sometimes you have to really think about too, like, um, you know, health literacy, health literacy, health liter literacy is not um, just can they read? It's do they understand what you're even talking about, you know? So we have to make sure that we're putting it in a phrase that the patient understands. You know, so sometimes we'll just use a scale of and have them point to where they feel like where they would have um, severe pain or have the patient point to the area where they have pain. So if you're trying to define where it's coming from, um, this is like the numeric one. Obviously, you go from zero to 10. 10 would be the worst pain possible. Um, some patients too, like if you have a difficult time with them, you know, rating it on a numeric scale, we'll use the face pain scale. Um, sometimes we use this like in kids um, because they can't understand one through 10. You know, it just doesn't make sense to them. So you would use like this face scale. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing too is we'll look at a flax scale. And this is actually for patients that would be, um, you know, this is like an ICU patient that is, um, or a patient that's comatose essentially. You really have to you know, think about how would you check for pain in a patient that you can't talk to or you can't ask them questions. So you really got to look at um, their expressions on their face. You know, they're, do they look like they're grimacing? You know, they may be intubated. So, you know, looking at their face, do they look like they're in pain? Do they look like they're crying? Because um, unfortunately, you'll see this. Are they moaning? So hearing things like that and just really observing your patient and looking at them um, obviously is critical in the patient that is um, comatose or intubated or sedated, essentially. Um, so looking at the legs, do they look like they're, um, you know, tense or um, drawn up to their abdomen, stuff like that. Um, sometimes you can't really assess that either because if they're on, um, sometimes when they're intubated, they'll be on a paralytic um, and they're sedated. So sometimes they're not even moving. But that's why it's important to look at like their facial, um, you know, grimacing or something like that, too. So this is just something to take a look at. Now, real briefly, because this is the PQRST was actually originated for assessing pain. We also use this to assess a symptom or a symptom analysis, which we'll talk about. Um, but when you're assessing pain, what makes it worse, which is P. So what provokes it? 
what's making it worse? Is it worse when you get out of bed? Is it worse when you um, eat? Is it worse when, um, you know, with exertion, when you're trying to walk? The quality of it. The quality of it is essentially what exactly what it would be. Is it dull? Is it achy? Is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Is it a burning sensation? Um, have you ever had a, um, you know, pain like this before? So it's looking at that, the type of pain that they're feeling. Radiation would be R or relief. Um, does it go anywhere? Do you have pain in your jaw? Do you have pain in your back with this? You know, does it radiate down your leg? Um, like for instance, if you're looking at chest pain, does you have, do you have pain in your left side of your arm or your jaw? You know, you're going to ask these questions because that's really what will help you determine what's going on with your patient. Um, sometimes to relief, like what makes it better or worse. So like, for instance, if we're looking at like the, ch like chest pain and their, um, you know, we're trying to figure out whether it's like pulmonary versus cardiac, you know, is it worse with breathing in or breathing out? Sometimes, like, if they're breathing in and it's, like, pleurisy or something or inflammation of the lining of the lungs, when they breathe in and breathe out and they have that pain, it kind of clues you into, like, okay, well, it's probably more likely related to their lungs, you know, versus their heart. We don't always assume that because heart is always number one. We always, you know, rule that out. But it helps you determine that. Severity, S, signs and symptoms. So, you know, this is your pain scale. Um, what other signs and symptoms? Remember, um, signs are your objective findings. Symptoms are your um, the patient's uh, subjective. So, you know, symptoms would be like, do they have nausea or vomiting with it? Do they feel dizzy? Are they sweating? Or um, do they look pale? Do they have shortness of breath? Um, you know, dyspnea, which is basically like shortness of breath. Um, are, their vital, are their vital signs abnormal or off? Um, timing or onset and duration, you always want to ask when it started. Is it constant? Is it intermittent? How long does it last? Does it go away or is it, um, you know, come and go? Does it, is it worse after you've eaten? Because sometimes too, like if you think about like gastritis or like an ulcer, do they feel worse after they eat? Is it better when they don't eat? Is it worse after you take your medicine? So like it depends on the context of the issue you're looking at, but these are the types of questions that you ask to, to help you determine what's going on with your patient basically. Um, like, for instance, um, like back pain or something. Like, is it worse when you get out of bed? Is it worse in the morning? Is it worse, you know, after you do a lot of activity? So, like I said, it just depends on what you're evaluating with it. Objective data, um, nonverbal, you can kind of look through this. Um, the difference, though, that to really look at, because this is another important thing, is with acute pain, they're going to typically have all of these you know, signs and symptoms there, the tachycardia, the high blood pressure, you know, the moaning, the grimacing. And unfortunately, with chronic pain, these patients have become so used to it that a lot of times they don't even express it anymore. And that's the other huge problem because if they're not expressing it, no one knows. So, you know, looking at your patient and, you know, if they're just getting around slow, this is really common in older adults because they're so used to living with it that they don't even bring it up anymore, which is unfortunate. And they, they find that it's like a normal process of aging, and it really isn't. I mean, it is, but we shouldn't treat it that way. Um, you know, change in appetite. So they're going to have some more of those chronic issues there. But you really got to look at, like, their face and, you know, are they – do they grimace when they get up? You know, they may not complain to you and say, oh, I'm in pain, but you might notice it when they get out of bed. Um, or you might notice them sighing. You know, they're not going to bring it up to you. That's unfortunate with the chronic pain part, unless it's really bad. But a lot of times they don't bring it up. Other objective data, which we kind of talked about, um, like with tachycardia, their blood pressure, anything, you know, it's just going to increase that sympathetic response there. Um, pulmonary, um, you know, hypoventilation. So sometimes, like, they may not take deep breaths because they have pain with it. Um, you know, if they had, like, let's say they had a, um, you know, uh, open heart surgery or something like that, they're going to not, they don't want to take deep breaths because it hurts their sternum, it hurts their chest. But it's a problem because, um, you know, they develop a lot of issues afterwards, like atelectasis. Atelectasis is basically, like, it's within the lungs, um, and it's typically associated, like, postoperatively. Um, so that's why you always will hear like um, after surgery they want the patient to get out of bed and cough because they want things to start moving because it, it otherwise it's like a snowball effect and they start getting other issues and I mean then they're even at risk for like you know developing pneumonia and all these other issues so just got to think of it that way. Um, you're obviously there's other um, GI issues. Some patients are in such bad pain that they actually have nausea and vomiting, um, urinary retention. Sometimes that's related to the medications that they're on. 
Um, but you really got to think about like, you know, the entire um, process here. Um, other physiologic changes, um, you know, they may have anxiety, like I said that from this, fatigue, depression. Um, it's actually been linked to with um, decreased immunity, um, sometimes too even pain medications, like long-term use of um, uh, pain medications can actually cause the patient to have um, an altered immune response, so sometimes they're actually more prone to infection. Um, and poorly controlled chronic pain, like I said, a lot of it is... Um, you know, these issues, they're really hard to, you know, take care of, essentially. And it really it causes issues with the family. So it's involving the patient and making sure that they have support and, you know, that the family understands as well. So, for instance, if you're giving pain medicine, these are just some general stuff to kind of look at with, um, you know, reassessment of pain after you give um, PO or IV medication. So remember when we talk about in pharmacology, um, administration of PO versus IV. If you're giving it PO, it's going to be a longer onset. If you give it IV, it's going to be a quick onset. So that will alter your assessment or reassessment. Um, but you always need to reassess your pain, make sure that what we're doing is treating it effectively because otherwise we need to change our plan of care. Um, it, it is important to understand that there is going to be a reasonable amount of pain. I mean, Patients, I mean, unfortunately, it's hard, but there, a lot of times, like for instance, if you're in surgery, you're not going to be 100% pain free. And, you know, a, a lot of patients understand this, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, you always want to check, um, you know, assess your pain if you get a new patient from another unit, because who knows, if they were in the ER, they might have, you know, not received anything until, you know, six hours ago. So you really got to, you know, be on top of it, because as you can see from before, when I talked about like some of the other effects, it can really you know, wreck havoc on like their vital signs and their blood pressure and all that. So you got to be on top of it. Like I mentioned with older adults, um, like I said, unfortunately, a lot of times they view this as a normal part of aging and they just live with it. And it's really unfortunate because a lot of times um, it causes, you know, social issues, um, mental status changes because they become depressed and withdrawn. Um, so you really got to, you know, make sure that um, they're functioning and, you um, you know, ask them how they're doing, can they do activity? It's just looking at all those factors with the older adult. Um, cultural effects on pain, because this is another huge area. So another thing too is with gender. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you have to, um, you know, be aware that certain religions and cultures and personal bias may have an effect on how, um, you know, they deal with pain or what they want to do to treat the pain. Um, some patients are very, um, you know, objective to taking pain meds because they're concerned that they're going to become addicted to it, especially nowadays. Um, but we really need to reassure patients that if they're taking it properly for pain, you know, the risk of addiction there is very low. It's when people are taking it inappropriately for other uses besides for pain. Um, so we got to be clear with that with our patients and educating them about that because it's unnecessary for someone to be in acute pain like that um, I don't know. It's just, it's something we got to think about. Um, you have to recognize your own prejudices and biases too. Like I said at the beginning, you don't want to just assume that this is a drug seeking patient. You really have to, uh, you know, assess your patient, patient and, you know, look at their complaints and their medical history along with it. Um, some other cultural change, uh, differences here, um, with Western culture, um, medications are typically first line of defense. So that's with typical traditional medicine in the U.S. Um, a lot of times it's, oh, here's a pain medicine. But there are other approaches and there are other alternative treatments. A lot of Eastern cultures will prefer like um, medicinal herbs, um, touch, or energy therapies or like acupuncture. Acupuncture is probably a big one. You'll see that used pretty frequent. Not all the time, but these actually, surprisingly, like some people are very hesitant to do it, but a lot of times they work. Um, so it's just like these alternative routes that you can think of and we have to be accepting if that's what patients want to use. Working for them, great. You know, we have to, you know, think about that stuff. Um, the other thing too, so if you have a patient that is non-English speaking or, um, you, you know, obviously they have difficulty with reading, you have to uh, make sure that you're addressing pain in an appropriate manner. So a lot of times we'll have pain scales that are in Spanish or Arabic or just different, um, you know, basically different languages so that we can help the patient explain their pain. Like I mentioned, 
older adults, they also have fears of being, um, you know, dependent on pain meds. They're like, oh, I don't want to take that every day of my life. And um, a lot of them are hesitant to getting treatments. Like they don't want to get a knee replacement because obviously it's a huge thing to go through, um, which is understandable. So, but unfortunately you'll find that these patients will live with a chronic, you know, let's say for instance, their knee, cause I worked with a lot of knee patients. They'll live like this for years and, and it's hard because, you know, it's affecting their activity and then, you know, they don't do things because of it. Um, so I don't know, it's hard. You got to really assess the aging adult with this. And obviously they have a lot of underlying conditions that predispose them for um, pain like arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, osteoporosis, because they'll have, you know, structural changes with that. Vascular disease, um, peripheral vascular disease, I think I mentioned it before, was they'll have claudication. So they get, um, you know, they're not getting good blood flow to their lower extremities. So they start getting, like if they're walking a lot, they'll have burning in their calves or they can't walk good. Um, so you really got to look at all these factors. You know, they have angina, so they, they may limit their activity because they got chest pain when they do stuff. Um, so it's, it's something that we got to think about. The other big thing, too, is like with dementia and Alzheimer's, the, the somatosensory cortex, like in your brain, essentially, is, is unaffected by dementia. So these patients are still experiencing pain. So that's why it's so important, like I said, when you're looking at like their face and grimacing or even like the comatose patient, patient you have to really think about, um, is this patient in pain? Because um, a lot of times it's sad and it's not treated appropriately. So you really got to be careful with that. Um, sensory discrimination is preserved in, in um, older adults and intact. So like I said, they... This is the same thing I was basically saying with Alzheimer's disease. Um, they still can really interpret pain, and we really have to look for those messages there. Um, gender differences, this is another thing, too, um, and a lot of it's related to um, just social expectations. I actually did a, um, in my master's program, I did, this is what I did, um, my my program, my uh, project on essentially, but I looked at differences in gender um, all the way from infant up to, you know, older adult. And we have, you know, it's just looking at that traditional men versus women. Men typically will not display, you know, pain. And it's very, very common versus women. Women are more emotional. Women will explain it. Women will show it. Not all, but a lot of them. Um, but we do need to realize like men have pain too. Um, there are hormones with women's that can influence pain. So a lot of times like women who, you know, during um, childbearing years, like menstruation, they'll be more sensitive to pain during that time. Um, women are mo more common, very, it's really common. Fibromyalgia is another one that's really, really common in women. Like you'll see it in men, but not nearly as much as you see it in women. And a lot of this is related to hormones too. I, that's my beliefs with it. Um, but it, it's just looking at the difference there. So looking at social factors, your hormones, genetic makeup, so genetics can play a role in it as well. Um, recently, this is just some tidbits of information. Um, and this is a lot of stuff too, like when we're looking at different treatments. There's a lot of genetic variants there that we kind of look at to um, tailor different treatments. So there's a lot of genes that um, basically may, might explain why some people have more pain than others. And even nowadays, like we look at certain meds, like we there are certain genes exist that like one medicine might work for one patient, but it's not going to work for another because of their genetics. Um, so as research goes on, this is areas that we kind of look at. So like I said, don't view it as a normal part of aging. It's very prevalent. We really need to make sure that our older adults are being treated appropriately. And it's really, as a nurse, it's about gaining that um, rapport with your patient, gaining trust with them. And so that's why it's so important to have those communication techniques and, uh, you know, down essentially to uh, make sure that you're communicating well with your patient and that they feel, you know, able to communicate with you. Like I said, look at those behavioral cues. When your patient gets up to go to the bathroom or, you know, you see them trying to get out of bed, you got to look at those um, factors. Do they look like they're getting up slow, fatigue, etc.? You can kind of read this, but... Um, it's looking at all those other factors as well. Um, the sudden onset of acute confusion, um, there's a few links with that and other things like infection in the older adult. Acute confusion is highly linked with infection. Um, but you also have to look at like poor um, pain control. That's another factor. 
this is just a sample documentation chart. This is something you can read, but this is like what you would typically document for your patient. I left this on here. There is a, this was from your book, a case study, um, but you can read it and it's just talking about pain, the pain scale. And it's looking at, if you um, expand and you look at the notes, it goes through like those um, peak URST, um, the acronym that we use for um, assessing pain. Okay, so that's it. If you um, have any questions, please let me know. Thanks. Have a great day.